My name's Chloe Risen, and I haven't made a spaceship yet. I'm hungry. Go, Hayden. <laughs> My name's Hayden Garrett. Um, this is Indie Not Films, and uh, you're listening to Haven't Made It Yet. Or today we're talking with uh, Chloe. Oh, we're doing Chloe. Um, hey, with this episode, <laughs> we're, we're, today we're talking with Chloe Risen, who's a production designer in the commercial world. Also does some narrative and music video. She's a, a great pal and a mentor. She's got a lot of fun things to say, and I don't think she talks about a rocket ship. <laughs> she does talk about the rocket ship. But, but it's definitely implied. It's on her mind. <laughs> it's on her mind. <laughs> the whole conversation was tough to get, you know, something on her because she's thinking about the rocket ship the whole time. But I'm really excited to someday talk about this rocket ship that she's going to make. Yeah, it's proverbial. But a lot more, I mean, just the, the conversation is just as interesting as a rocket ship. So, yeah. But, and rocket ships are pretty, I guess, pretty interesting. Th- that's what I've heard. Yeah. I, I, uh, especially, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chloe Ryzen, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> making it for me in terms of my career in terms of production designing is being able to have enough people to do each job well so that you're you're enjoying the process and you're doing all the things that are creative or whatever of the job but mostly that everybody there will always probably be rough days but for the most part people can have a work life balance while they're making something that they really care about that they can go home and that everyone feels supported and nobody one of the biggest lessons I've learned is In terms of crew morale or finishing a project, it's really, really important to give people tasks that they can finish and letting people finish a task before they give them another one. So having projects that work on any scale where somebody is being given something to do and they can feel like they accomplished it, maybe they won't be proud of it, but they're fine with the work they've done. The ideal is that they're proud of it, you know, Mm -hmm. but only so much pride, like (laughs) at the end of a day or a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff, but um so that people can finish what they do before they get the next thing and that they have a sense of minor accomplishments along the way. And it's not just the slog of being just absolutely one thing being thrown at you. You never finish anything. You get another thing thrown at you and then just time after time. And it just compounds somebody's like self-worth or their stress or all these things because the brain needs to finish and close out projects in order to move forward. So having a team to create what we're creating, Mm -hmm. all of us, still feel like we can have a life and an identity outside of what we're doing. Totally. That we're not only safe, but that everybody gets to complete something, complete their own tasks on the day that they can feel like they finished it, that they've done something with their day, with their time. Yeah. What made you go jump into that career? I started when I was 19. I took a summer class at my university and uh, the professor commented that I was the only one looking at production design. Mm. It was a film class. And most of the students were grad students when they started hiring me as a production designer. I worked um, while I was going to college. I built my portfolio just doing a bunch of their shorts. 13 years later, every time I've applied for a job that's not in production design, it hasn't worked. Hmm. And every time I've just let go, things have worked. So I really like what I do. I'm excited to do it. Yeah. Uh, it took me a while to even understand what what I was doing. Oh, okay. I'm talking about that when I'm like 19, 20. You yeah. Know? yeah. Have you had a normal job since 19? <laughs> Normal, quote unquote. <laughs> I um, was a waitress at a shisha bar in New York. Like, it's kind of like a cafe. It's really sweet called Sultana down uh-huh. on Sixth Street in Alphabet City. And I was a very bad waitress there. I dropped hot coals on a lot of people. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I that doesn't sound like something you want to do. I wasn't very good at it either. I mean, I'm, I think that's the other part besides of it. That, is, yeah. Besides the hot, cool thing. Still well, just wasn't. It, was, <laughs> it was really nice people. It was a really cool place. But yeah. yeah, it was more like a cafe. Okay. So the whole going into Hollywood, being a barista wasn't really your I would have been route. a horrible barista. <laughs> I would have been an awful barista. Yeah. I, and I assisted a friend of mine for a few years. I was He was a producer and I was his assistant for a few years. Um, and then I went back to production design to do some features and that's awesome. what brought me back to it. Yeah. I had, so I guess I did have a choice to not do it at one point or another. Yeah. You kind of just did these roles because you, were you the only one 
that was willing to do them? Or was that kind of starting into college, that's something you wanted to do? That's a good question. <laughs> Thank you. And I think Yannick and I have the, one of the same diseases mentally, which is like mm. if something's challenging or interesting, we're going to latch on and we're going to try to do it. If it's complicated and we might fail, we're going to try it. And a lot of the jobs weren't set up for a success and no one else would do them. They were unpaid. They were 33-hour mm -hmm. days, even into commercials that were 33-hour days when they were paid, with like three-hour turnarounds. Wow. They weren't fun. Nobody else wanted to do them. And I knew how to use power tools just a little bit. I'm not a good carpenter. I'm not good at building things. But compared to, you know, I'm confident enough that I can throw something up on a wall and make yeah. it last long enough. Yeah. So at that age, at like 19, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I had more skill. I had some skills, but I think for the most part, it's just anyone that asks you, like, do you want to try something? It's really hard to say no. Like, yeah, if yeah. I were to ask Yannick, do you want to tile a bathroom right now? <laughs> Even if, for, for no reason at all, you'd probably say. He was actually just doing that in his free time yesterday. Were you really? <laughs> no. no. But you could have been. But he could have been. You could yeah. have been. I, w I would be tempted to tile. I mean, it's all very exciting, and you want to learn all the skills and everything yeah. at first. And then... At some point, there's a joy in just making the decisions and not doing anything yourself. Like, yeah. Because there's people that can do it well. Right. Not fighting battles Delegating. that you're going to lose. Yeah. yeah. Well, and letting other people that are really good at it shine and get praised for their work and get paid for their work. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe talk about that a little bit more of the process of finding the right person for the right thing and how you go about doing that. Yeah. I think in the non-union world, it's really interesting because... There's less of a vetting process. I, although I guess we work with a lot of union carpenters and some really incredible people. The vetting process, there is like a level of skill that you're vetting for, but mostly it's making sure that somebody's going to show up on time, that they're going to be honest, that they're going to be accountable. It helps if you hire people within a world where you know someone else there that they know, even if it's not in a professional sense because they're less likely to let you down. They're more likely to fall through with the job. You can hold them socially accountable a little bit because that mm. is a major factor of it. We have um, we work with a wide variety of people, and a lot of them have been abused by these productions. Yeah. So they they start off, you know, and I do this too. But you start off really like um, defensive. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then negotiating style, and you have to earn somebody's trust. So the first few times you work with somebody, sometimes it can be like a process of you vetting one another to see yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and that, that's something that will talked about too with him as a production uh manager everyone's always thinking he's out to get them <laughs> yeah will does a great job will's fantastic to work with and yeah. he did a great job on the podcast i met will oh, when good. he was doing um he mentioned that he was working for his father's wife's daughter or something like that okay but she was a producer and she's incredible but she, he was working for her in new york and that's when i met him as a pa okay so i met him when he was i don't know maybe 20 and we would have in him new drive york. our trucks yeah, yeah and we okay. all thought he was four or five years older than he was <laughs> and we were absolutely doing what he was saying where we're like yeah. you can park this right like here take this or, oh you're the person these. that told him to drive that truck <laughs> i was not i was not in new york we would all drive you would all yeah. drive the truck and yeah. I, it's actually you did like knowing which freeways you're allowed to go on are harder, but it's a lot easier because you can only go a certain speed for the most part. Mm. And you're only really responsible for going forward most yeah. of the time. Yeah. Versus in LA. That's like people are doing all sorts yeah, of things. Back and forth. Yeah. But in New York, you're going a lot slower and it takes like three hours to go like 10 miles. Yeah. 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 How long were you in New York? I was there the first eight years. Um, okay. I pretty much worked there up until the pandemic. And yeah. then I... I've only been here since then. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's been pretty, pretty new. In, pretty recent. In yeah. I moved here in 2016, but I continued to take jobs there. And we, we fly different places or you fly crew different places. Yeah. Yeah. That's why, cool. Why did you decide to move? I, I, I'm really glad I moved. Um, I wanted to do more builds. So anyone that's starting out as a production designer, you're going to start out dressing sets and probably you're the only one in your department. So you will mm. get the title as production designer. But for a long time, you're either just a set dresser or just a prop stylist because the production doesn't have the build the budget to either build things or to paint the walls or to make some of these other choices or even to rent furniture. You know, yeah. a lot of the times you start off just doing like unorthodox, like unacceptable amounts of buys and returns from like Bed Bath Beyond or yeah. 
target. And then as you get a little further and you have a budget, you're able to stop doing that. Yeah. I'm and cut back on that. I'm currently still dealing with some Amazon returns from something from a month ago. Yeah. And it just, it never ends. And I'm like, I'm <laughs> never doing returns again. And then I do it again. Well, and it doesn't feel good and it's not yeah, right. It's I mean, there's ethical. times when you're auditioning something and that is ethical. Yeah. And you'll get to a point where you can just do that and insist that and have people respect that and where you can do enough pre-production that, yeah. you know, but it takes a while to get there. So if, if there's a situation, because that was kind of what happened to me um, where I was like, hey, to be able to pull this off. And I, I regret doing this, but I was like, hey, we, we can do returns and get some of the budget back, which I shouldn't have done because now they know that these mm -hmm. are all these are the production company that's also pretty new and I'll be working with them again, hopefully. Mm -hmm. But um, how do you? Do you, how do you tell people no? I make them that. You just do it, them, or have their PA or somebody they really. Usually, they'll have a girlfriend as a PA, or somebody that's actually really, or or boyfriend, or a friend as a PA. That's re somebody really close to them doing a favor on these smaller productions. Uh -huh. There's usually somebody that has that's a friend that's giving them a job. You have a way for them to make that person do the return, so that they, if they won't do it themselves, if the producer won't do the return themselves, if they won't go and lie to the people at Target yeah. themselves and feel what that feels like, you make their friend do it. So that, you know, it's like, you know, and you can phrase it in different ways. You know, your hours at this stage cost more than a PA's. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. So you say, do you want to spend my time doing this or do you want to spend a PA's? This is yeah. how much you're looking to get back. And you have to make that call for yourself. But so what if it's online, like like in my case, where it's through my account? And I mean, we've I've worked with you and we've been kind of in this situation mm -hmm. um, where it's physically been dropped off, but then there's still little backs and forths and. And it's awful, right? Because it, it takes on. months. It takes yeah. like 30 days to get your money back. And then you can't close out of the account or get paid for your job until the Amazon stuff is back mm, in your yeah. account with indie productions that are doing this incorrectly, right? Yeah. We're, we're not talking about the right way to do things. Right. We're talking yeah, about yeah, how is, you triage a bad situation. How? Yeah, like how do you survive with... Because it seems to be the stage, obviously, where you're working with, not, with smaller stuff and people that are also figuring it out. So... Surviving well, that stage, you know? And, you know, and this is, you know, I've been in the non-union world only for 13 years. Mm -hmm. And every single production wants to reinvent the wheel to save. They're like, oh, this is this is stupid. Why are we doing this this way? Yeah. They're trying to reinvent the wheel by doing something. They're trying to save money. And they're lessons that you've already learned. Every single time yeah. you're going through this, it's a producer that's never done this before. But you've learned this lesson yeah. so many times. And it's awful to face it again. So anytime you have to like learn your own lesson, you have them learn it. It becomes their oh. Amazon account. They're mm, not going to yeah. get the object in time. And it does feel bad. But sometimes if you put clearly like in order to have this, you know, just be kind. But you have to say it ahead of time. If you want this object by this date, you need to order it by this time. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if not, then you're going to pay more. You're going to pay for a rental fee, which is what they should be doing. So yeah. that's just part of it is it, you yeah. can't go back and fix it. You can never go backwards and fix it. You just yeah. fix it on the next just, one. And you're going to make mistakes on every single one of them. Right. Every single job you have like a regret that you're holding on to. And, and money is kind of a good way to kind of make that mistake hurt. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll know not yeah. to do it again the next time. Money is kind of the only leveraging power you actually have as a production, like in our department at all, because somebody's come to you with a big idea. And whether the idea is great or not great, you have a limited amount of resources to yeah. make it happen. And not burning yourself out or burning other people out is the is actually your responsibility. Somebody mm. beneath you that that's like an artist, they can pour their heart and soul into like, you know, something they're painting or something like this, you know, if they're doing a background. But your job is to make sure that they don't wear themselves out and yourself out and that it's sustainable and that everything can get paid for yeah, in yeah. the process. So at, to your point, yeah, money is the only way to commute. Money and time are like the only ways to communicate things. Mm -hmm. Money, time and manpower. Well, that's what they're listening. That's what they're, yeah, they're yeah, hearing. That's what gets a response. And a lot yeah. of times they have somebody in, that's really, you know, kind hearted and really wants to be there that wants to be in the department. That's there, not getting reimbursed for their time, not being yeah. paid, yeah. not being treated well. Or that's a friend of theirs that doesn't want to be there, but that's helping out. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's a difficult thing is when you're given a whole person and you have your heart to look at this person and be like, I really don't want to make you do this thing. I tried to not do this thing at all. But as soon as you're saying those words, you're like talking trash, you know, you don't want to get into that loop. And that's a really hard thing to to be like, I'm going to ask you to do something that I know is wrong. Yeah. yeah. And I tried to not ask you to do this. Here you are. <laughs> so we're yeah. going to go do this. And it's awful. Mm -hmm. And it's like. There's always also the breaking point on every job where you've gotten, usually it's rap, right? Because you've been forcing so hard to make something happen 
that you've forgotten how to, that you have to get rid of it. Mm. Like even if you plan a wrap, it's not going to go as scheduled because you go over time and you lose the hours. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyways, or you know, there suddenly you have to share the camera truck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, it's you're kind of just destroying. Yeah, you're like destroying something you worked so hard on, and you end up. I mean, I know you do too, but I also end up just keeping a lot of the things that yeah. I've like because this is like either I didn't get to use it in the way I wanted to, and, and I built it, and it was just completely ignored. For example, I have these like black frames hanging in my hallway that we're looking at right now, and. And I know you have a bunch of wall flats from from jobs just stored in the garage. No, not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah. I have um, some picture frames that they need to get out, and I have a bunch of the thing that's that's bothering me right now is I have a bunch of fake German candy boxes. Oh, I from re- that Linda. So you job. have like ninety of those. Yeah, I have ninety of those, and they're in my car. Yeah, <laughs> and they're awful, and I, I but I don't want to throw them away because I know someone else needs them. Yeah. But yeah, my goal is to not set decorate or prop style anymore. I hope I and because I had an injury. And that really helped me. Sometimes it's like the amount of communicating what it needs to do to do the thing yeah. sometimes emotionally feels so much larger than if you just did it yourself. Mm-hmm. And it yeah. really takes a lot to get to the point where you're like, here's all the information. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, hey. I'm not going to do it myself. You, you, you know, and then that's how you get people paid. And that's how the system works a lot better. Because when yeah. you're young, there's that crossroads of like, like the first jobs you'll take, it's always just you doing everything. And mm-hmm. if you're lucky, a PA, that's also production. <laughs> yeah. Right. And you're the prop stylist or this addresser. And then if you want to, if you decide that you like this work, and I think liking the work means liking making the decisions, right? Like, and it's not being the decision maker. It's like working with the team, the camera team, the lighting team, the director to kind of figure out like, what this concept means, like the actual design process of it, that's mm-hmm. the work and that's the fun stuff. Yeah. Even the logistics of it can be fun. If you decide you like it, then going and being in a space where you can start building more stuff. And in New York, there's a few studios, but for the most part, you have to be in the union mm-hmm. to yeah. use them. It's really, I didn't have much builds over there, but out here, there's a lot more opportunities to build and grow and work for other people that know what they're doing way better than you. Yeah. yeah. What are the other differences you've noticed between New York and L.A.? I loved ta- listening to Will talk about it. <laughs> yeah. It was awesome. Um, yeah, because yeah, he was on some awful jobs with us. We threw him a bunch of returns so many times. When they were like, we won't give you a wrap day, Will can handle it. Will is oh, in great. the office. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Companion episode. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Will complaining about New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it is fun, but it is like what he's saying. It's like how many, it's like 10 degrees and you're on a dock near a bunch of houseboats people are sleeping in these boats you're bothering them it's like midnight and you've just been outside for like four hours and you're shivering you know it's the weathers or the weather is one thing but it's also like the pride and the work ethic like out here people are proud to like do an ethic to like stand up for their rights and stuff like this it's a very union city so people are like you can't treat me this way all of that stuff is beautiful because in new york it's like you know, you go home and you brag, I slept two hours. And yeah. I went back out on Slept an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. And that whole culture, it's just, you know, there's something really cool to it if you're actually going through something important, but you're not. You're making a commercial for you know, yeah. some, client, <laughs> some client some client that doesn't does that doesn't even care about this commercial they're making, you know. Yeah. So that's it's not worth it. But it's part of the appeal for people working in, in New York that like Oh, yeah, I'm working so hard. Look at me. Well, I think they just work really. I don't think it's even ego. I think it's just they're genuinely hard workers and stuff and yeah. they want to do a good job. And I, very, I don't know, everyone I worked with out there was super smart. But I just think there's not a culture of like setting your boundaries and like the idea of like, I worked hard <laughs> being like, I worked correctly within this time frame and these parameters. Yeah. Yeah. And it does feel also like sometimes you'll be on a job and you you have to go tell the producer, like, you missed lunch. I'm not very good at this yet. I'm working on it. But like, hey, we missed lunch. Mm-hmm. You have to, they're going to charge you a penalty. Yeah. yeah. Like that, it feels really, still it feels instinctively bad for me. It's easier having other people you're advocating for. Your rights get taken care of more when you're advocating for someone other than yourself, unless you're a certain type of person. Yeah. Good for them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah. And having crew that reminds you that time has passed or that something's wrong or that is comfortable enough telling you that you're messing up. It's awesome. Uh, yeah. Really important. And I mean, that should be, shouldn't that be the producer's job to tell you to take lunch or is that, 
Well, it, it is their job, but there's sometimes when the production's just going so south and we're all just pushing to get through it oh, that yeah. they're hoping that like it costs like they can't stopping the scene and having lunch in the middle of it will be a disruption yeah. that will take more time. And they're hoping, you know, they can say grace, they can ask for grace or something like that. But um, they're hoping that you just go through it yeah. or they're not watching the time or they're just stressed out and they don't have the money, you know. Right. So they just want you to kind of mm-hmm. sh- shove food in your mouth while yeah. you're nailing things together. Yeah, because yeah, this is non-union. It's indie. Yeah. It's, I'm sure it happens on the other things too, but it's, what? you know, it, like Will said, we don't know the rules. I don't know. Yeah. I have like three versions of every rule and I advocate whichever one is going to benefit me in the moment. <laughs> and I really need to sit down with Will and be like, okay, lay, lay it all yeah. out for me. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> we, we work 29 miles from the 30 mile line. Oh, wow. That's our main studio that we work from. Uh, <laughs> they did that. On, I'm sure actually they probably did that on purpose. To some no, degree. they had no idea. They're really? sweet people. They had no idea. Okay. They don't really do physical productions. So. Oh, right. Because they just bought it. So yeah. you park your car it. a mile away. And then you walk <laughs> to work. And then you walk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I, I know the studio you're talking about. There's no parking nearby, so well, I guess a little lot in the back. They're, working, a on lot. They're working on. They're it. working on it. They're good people, but they they come from a different type of production. So you're watching them like learn everything for the first time and come at it with like a full ambitious heart and being like, we're not like other production companies. We're real people. Yeah. We're gonna do it this way. And then you're like, if you do it this way, it's gonna it's gonna be so much worse in the long run if something goes wrong. If something works out, it's gonna be great. But nothing ever works out. Yeah. There's a reason you do things the stupid way. Yeah. yeah. Is and it's like you have to, you know, put everything in the email and get everything approved so you're not on the line for anything. And every <laughs> lesson you learn. Speaking of uh I, I, just for context, Chloe's the one that's taught me almost everything I know about the art department. True. Um, so give me that look. I just recently did my first uh, production design thing. And uh, in the past, I would always see Chloe running around like crazy and, and like having these like arguments with people. And I just thought that that was just kind of your personality that you wouldn't let people talk down on you and you were just doing that. Well, my instinct would have been to, to you know, find a more passive way. And I just thought that's just kind of how you did things versus me. But then when I did production design for the first time, it all started to make sense to me. And I've told you this before, but like the, these battles that you're having is because our department is always the first one to get the budget cut. If, at least it feels like when, oh, we need more, Cameron, Cameron needs more money. Let's get them that money, of course. Um, mm-hmm. Let's take a, a, an RPA away. And you kind of watch your vision crumble slowly as throughout the production and things yeah. getting cut and art's always the first one to get cut. And these battles that you're having is is you defending the art that you feel personally attached to. Yeah. And I, I was left on the production that I did. Uh, there was a moment where I just had to personally detach um, from the art that I was making, which sucks as an artist, but it, it it's a decision you sometimes have to make Um because it's it's a battle to get your vision out there and and uh, um, yeah, I just that's something I learned from you. Well, I mean, I think it's interesting because it's like eighty percent of the time, if somebody's upset, it's because they're trying to do a good job and they're being impeded. Mm-hmm. Not everybody's perfect. Not everyone's good, and some people just want to fight or they're angry for some argument they had on the last job, and they can't let it out on that person. And you're the new person, literally taking the role. You know, you've become like an archetype <laughs> that they're yeah. gonna let it out on. But eighty percent of the time, it's because they also want to do a good job. Yeah, and they're fighting, and in their mind, this is what they need for their department to succeed. But along those lines, you know, you have to really. I've my. I think your personality changes in whatever job you do. Yeah. You do it long enough, and mine has definitely bled into my own life. I'm. It's very interesting to see those and like try to mitigate, you know, communication styles that you've picked up on. I was lucky that the people that I trained from were really good communicators. Mm-hmm. There's like, all of them were great. I had a few people in New York that I worked for, and one out here in LA, and um, when in my early twenties, and they were all just so kind and compassionate. And I've still managed to pick up bad habits despite them. Just stress and dealing with people. It's really hard for to say no to somebody when they want something. Yeah. But sometimes you have to say no even when it's a doable thing because they're just going to keep asking for more and more stuff. And you can say no and still give them the thing. Yeah. But you say no to them. That's something I had success with in the past. But the last few months I've tried that. And they'll be like, I thought you said no to this. And that's a new one for me. <laughs> you mm, know, yeah. we are like, I said no, because I need you to stop asking for little tiny things, you know? Yeah, I see. Because it's like you have to, 
you know, you have this whole big thing that has all these t- little tiny steps and then you're constantly getting stopped by the lighting department being like, right now I need you to hand that curtain so that I can do my thing. Yeah. And you're like, I'll hand the curtain. I just really need this paint to dry. <laughs> so we got to get the paint drying so that I can hand the curtains. So that, And it's all tiny stuff. But our, our department gets cut a lot. But the good thing about our department is like you can always, if somebody cuts your PAs, you say, we have a couch that needs to go up a flight of stairs. Yeah. And they go, yeah, you can do it. And you go, how many people does it take to lift a couch? And they go, yeah. oh, okay. And you just have to take somebody back, slow them down, mm-hmm. and let them imagine. And if they're really not reasonable which it doesn't happen a lot yeah usually they do want you to succeed but sometimes they don't and it's not even malicious it's just this person's had it up to wherever with whatever yeah no nobody's trying to actively destroy what you're doing or or get in your way or whatever yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah. and the other thing about us getting cut the most is like um we're with the project a lot longer than the camera department Mm -hmm. they might do a shot list but then they kind of tap out for a bit. Mm -hmm. So whoever you have the most intimacy with in your life is the one that usually takes the biggest burden, right? Mm -hmm. So they they feel more comfortable going to you and being like, Yannick, I can't, I need you to take on some (laughs) extra stuff. I can't help you out because you're closer to me. This stranger I really want to impress. Yeah, (laughs) You'll understand when I ask you this, but the stranger won't. So I don't know if that's even interesting, but... That's something no, I think about a lot. Observation. Yeah. yeah, I have a, it's, you asked me like how I started this and I didn't have a really good like answer because it just kind of all flows into one another. And I don't know, I don't think for a while I tried to set those like five year plans uh-huh. or those concrete goals Yeah, and things never work out the way you do. And it's not really healthy to like adhere to them. It's better just to see what comes and enjoy it in the process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I mean... We can have ideas of what we want to do, but you kind of have to go with the cards that you're dealt as well. Yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, but also just keep saying that you want to do it. It's like Will said. Yeah. A lot of people will want to help you and we won't get the opportunity. We can't hire as many people as we need to do the job, let alone as many people as we want to hire. Mm-hmm. You know, we all want the biggest team possible and we all want to share the pie the most because it makes the pie easier. I yeah. don't know if that's a... <laughs> But, um, Easy pie. Yeah, you'll find the right crew, especially with camera. It's about finding the right one or two DPs and being mm-hmm. a good friend. And if you still want that, but maybe you're discovering other things that you really like along the way. I want to at least do something that I know it can be fun, which art department tends like as, as stressful as it could be. Um, and as as much as a lot of people tend to put the blame on art department like you're with a great community of people and you're you're you see something being made from the ground up and you get to see that creation you don't really see like as when I was a a camera operator in Portland I'd do some amazing shots I'd hand it to the um data management person and I'd never see him again (laughs) and I'd be like wow that was one cool shot that I did (laughs) I I I will will, it will never see the light of day (laughs) yeah I think that, yeah, all of our jobs have that, like, never see the light of day. And at, at some point, you have to rewire your brain so that that's not the joy. Mm, it's yeah. like, like, there's nothing to take home. Yeah. And that's, you know, what we're physically well, dealing there with. There is always a little <laughs> bit to take home. <laughs> if you do it right, I've seen your not, garage. <laughs> God, luckily, no, it's, like, all know. cardboard yeah. right now. Okay. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> no, uh, camera is interesting because it's, like, you get to hone one set of skills. So you'll be able to show up. You'll be able to do your set of skills and be the best at it. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting thing where you're getting, maybe you get a fulfillment or something. I don't know. I've never been in camera. I've done some sound mixing when I was young, but um, art department, you've usually not done the specific thing that you're doing. Mm-hmm. So you're mm-hmm. set up for a new type of failure every time, which is exciting. And if you're that personality type, you're going to go into it, but you're absolutely going to fail and you're going to get used to it. So it's a little more adventure, right? Yeah camera you're doing the same thing every day and i think it is possible to get a little lost in the monotony of it and art department is like a new dirty tetanus filled horizon every time <laughs> yeah T- tell us what you're working on right now if you're if you can um yeah we're, we're building a miniature a miniature house right now and that's right pretty there. fun but it's a lot of 3d printing and i do modeling for um sets so i can do 3d models but they're not structurally as silly as this sounds, structurally sound. They're not made correctly for like printing. And the other person that's helping us from the production is really like 
had to cover a lot of my vertices. Okay. <laughs> I've been ha- pilot handing over these piles of just like yeah. messed up models. It's not very interesting. Because I mean, I mean, when you design it um, uh, on um, what's the program? I use Blender. Yeah, on like on Blender, on Blender you, you're just making it for the looks. So now yeah. you, the first time you have to actually make it structurally sound. In, well, in a sense, y- right? there's like normals, and you have to make sure that the face, the walls are communicating to the printer in the right way. Mm-hmm. And that's a whole thing. Like anytime, every time I try to do something myself, when there's a professional to hire, I just regret it. And we were lucky to like, we worked with there, you have it 3d and they're awesome. They're yeah. so good. They're making little keen assets and they do molds and stuff. Nice. Yeah. But just to the, on the point of every time it's something new, like <laughs> last time I worked with you, it was a like VR goggles and there was the problem, like there was a whole nother world happening in the goggles while we're all, we're building the world yeah. around the goggles and yeah. then the, those two meet somehow. And it's yeah. like so hard to communicate. There's like, like a 3d object in the space that doesn't actually exist that we have to build around Yeah, every time it's something crazy and different. Yeah. The VR thing has been very interesting. That's when like mostly what I've been doing the best six months. And sometimes you get a new headset that's under like a massive NDA and it's your second camera. And so you actually don't know the camera angles on it until you get it on. So we had, we were building some, we were in a studio that doesn't have the appropriate like uh, trust system, the appropriate ceilings, appropriate grid for doing like hard ceilings and doing ceilings efficiently. And it mm. was a low budget thing. Yeah. So we had soft ceilings and we didn't have them over the entire set. And we didn't account for, we built our walls a little bit higher. We didn't account for it to be a wide angle lens on the actor. So now your camera's not only like six feet in the air. It's on a wide angle lens, so it's like a lot of that and stuff. Like a 360 wow. turn, so usually, you know, the sets are have like a, a sometimes like a wall you can pull away at the camera, that, it's 360 degrees. Everything was 360, and then you have to shoot it on the B cam, which is what they were calling just the camera. So you rethink like living rooms and stuff, because it requires like your normal life yeah. to look like it accommodates this 10-foot space that you don't have in your New York apartment. So all of the apartments are colossal you know they're all aspirational as they say yeah yeah it's it's like that in in movies when there's the starving artist but he has like a loft yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. rent and rent in every film is like they're living on a different rent system (laughs) yeah yeah any stories come to mind of like like um set catastrophes or funny moments that happened well the first set i was ever on i was on um there was a car accident and I heard that the guy in the other car lost his leg. I'm not sure, but oh our director, the director broke his ribs or no, he broke his, the DP broke his ribs. The director broke his pelvis and the actor broke his leg. He had a seizure. They weren't doing things correctly. I was 19. They, they, you know, they didn't have a picture car. They really had this guy driving a cab they had rented and he had a seizure because they were working really long hours. Yeah. The actor had a seizure while he was driving oh. and yeah. And so then, you know, you spend hours in the hospital with them making sure that, yeah, but that was like the first job. I think that's a pretty good wake up call. It's like what you're doing, people can die. Yeah. I heard you say, don't catch anything with Will. Don't catch it. If something heavy is falling, don't (laughs) catch it. Yeah. If you ever get Ashton on the program, you should have him tell some horror stories. Yeah. 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 Don't catch anything falling, especially wood or lumber. Let it fall. Yeah. (laughs) Anything bigger than you. Yeah. Yeah. What, what about the one with the giant walls that they like wanted to raise and like that like oh, fighting one? Yeah, we did um we did a show in Florida. It had moved it moved states last minute and it was a bunch of stacked shipping containers. I did but so many things wrong on this one. Um this is probably like the most painful memory I have. Oh, here we um, go. Yeah, it was painful in all directions. I underbid the job. Um even with like a 30% contingency, I underbid the job. I really should have passed on this job, but I was excited to like prove that I could do it, you know, and luckily no one got hurt, but we had a bunch six shipping containers that we bought. They got shipped originally to, to this other state. And then they had to move to last minute to Florida, but there was like a hurricane. And then we got to the place and we couldn't deliver them at first because the studio they had bought had a one wall separating them. Uh-huh. But they didn't have the permits to take. They took down the wall without the permits. Okay. <laughs> and we didn't know that at first. Anyways, we're waiting for this wall to come down. The stuff arrives. We have in the contract three months to build the thing. We had like two and a half, three weeks to actually build it because it changed states and all this stuff. So shipping containers come and we stack them and we're almost ready. And the director goes, we need to, the mayor of the city is approaching on seven feet. 
So he's an old WWE wrestler. So we need to raise it all up one foot so that it looks big in comparison to him because he's going to be a guest of honor. Yeah. So silly. So we get it in. The, we, you know, we're starting to build the pit. The lighting guys come and they need to lower the grid suddenly. So we have to take apart the entire like UFC style fighting pit. We're behind schedule. The director said he wanted to redo it. And I went to the producer and I said, if you redo this, you're going to be late. This isn't going to happen. It's a live show. It's going to be late. And one of my guys was nearby and the director heard this and he just turned and he goes to him, can you do it? And he goes, yeah. So he went behind me and had the guys do it and they're late. So at the end of the program, like I'm fiddling with a prop that should have been just like somebody else should have made it. We got it fabricated. We had all the pieces, but we're just literally trying to put it together. And it's really important for the show. Mm -hmm. And it was absolutely important that it was there. And it wasn't done on time because the person trying to do that is spent the last three days reassembling this stupid pit, (laughs) you know? Oh my God. I just remember being in the back of the parking lot. Everyone had done unacceptable hours. It was absolutely unacceptable in so many ways. And just like trying to get the stupid, there's this, um, there's two ways to make things glow. Like in Tron, they have this paint product where it Uh, conducts electricity. Mm -hmm. So we had just gotten it and we're like trying to, it's, we're way too late. We definitely messed up on that. But you know, the situation like, uh, sorry, there's a lot of stuff that I'm not saying. There's things like, we're behind schedule. It's the day before the thing. And the director will come up and ask something like, I need a crocodile on set. I need these models to walk a crocodile. There's going to be alcohol. There's live fighting. <laughs> There's going to be a crocodile. At one point, the city came in and they're like, this building isn't supported. It doesn't have the structure for it. So you, like, it doesn't have the, when we knocked down the wall, we knocked out one crucial support. Yeah. So they were trying to shut everything oh down. There's no producer on set. There's no director on set. It's just me. And some lighting guys. And the lighting guys were like, not my problem because they're wiser than me. That's what I should have done. I should have let the thing get shut down. (laughs) But instead I go and we find an architect and we find an engineer and we get the plans to make it structurally sound. We have a bunch of I-beams. It's a big warehouse space. So I-beams are those big steel beams Mm -hmm. that look like an eye. Okay. You'll see them. So you'll see them in like, anyways, they're these big metal beams. So we get one, we've, we correctly install it. We get it correctly installed. We get it checked out by the city. We get them to sign off on it. But in that process, we lost like three days and it costs like, I don't know, 7,000, 8,000 worth of do- dollars that they never added to the budget. Oh so God. I ended up paying for it myself. Oh my, oh God. my God. Yeah. So anyways, like the last few minutes of the thing are happening. A lot of stuff happened. We're so lucky no one fell. This was like a 20 foot set. We're so lucky the the shipping, like everything happened correctly. We had a really good crew, a really group, yeah. good group of local guys that were a little wild, Florida wild. And then, you know, Florida man. Alan was on it and L dad mm. and Maddie. Yeah. So they were like our three California crew. Yeah. And yeah, we got really lucky along the way. I met a welder at Whole, Fo- Whole Foods that turned out to jump in <laughs> on some stuff and just like, <laughs> we had a welding team and all of that. How'd you know he but, was a welder? Um, He was getting dumped in Whole Foods and he was a, I found out somehow he likes, I was waiting for a ride or something. And he was like, he's a union boil ma- boiler maker. And he, so he had his card and everything like oh, this. Okay. And he was great. He was absolutely wonderful. But he plugged us in with this welding school. And so we had somebody that had been doing contract work overseas that we'd met, we had met along the way. It's like a whole thing. You always couple together a crew. They're yeah. excellent. These <laughs> people the were certified, characters. but it was wild. And I was paying everybody, right? <laughs> Through yeah. my accounts and stuff. I was doing payroll. I had the insurance policy because I found out production didn't have insurance. Oh, good. So I bought insurance. What, what did they have? <sighs> they I mean. had a couple million dollars. Oh. <laughs> and that's like <laughs> the thing, right? It's like you can, like, I should have said no to this project for so many reasons, but I didn't. Yeah, the city almost shut us down. Everything was behind schedule. I wasn't communicating while well. my brain was starting to shut down because of all the details. Yeah. Yeah. Our guys were working really hard. They worked so hard and they just got insulted. The producer threatened to, and it's on camera, threatened to murder one of my guys oh. at one point. <laughs> yeah. Good that it's on camera. It's good that it's on co- yeah. camera, but then he wanted to sue and then you're stopping all this stuff. And then at the end of the day, I like had to pay 16000 out of pocket just to get uh, everyone's overtime. Yeah, yeah. You're they said they were going to reimburse all this stuff. So yeah. all of the lessons I learned on this one, it's like, don't go too fast. Don't go too far. Don't step punch above your weight. Mm-hmm. Like it's not worth it. And I've never shown anyone the final, even though what we made is really cool. It's not on my website. I don't share it because yeah. it's like, it's, I shouldn't be doing jobs at that level. Now it's been three years. 
So now I feel like I would be able to hire the right people and slow myself down Mm -hmm. enough and make sure everything was in writing. And also to know that those people can't be worked with. There's some certain signs that you have to learn along the way and you have to fail. There's some people you can never work with. You'll never be able to trust them. Yeah, That's a good uh, segue. What are those signs? And what are those? I mean, in writing, that's a big one. Yeah, I mean, that's really hard um, because there's so many different people out there and they're all redeemable on some level or there's some job that with them they'll work. We worked one job with somebody that's always really wonderful, but, you know, the company always promises stuff and then you find out it's net 45 or yeah. something like this. With net meaning that you get paid 45 minimum or the latest they can pay you after the job is 45 days. There's like yeah. net 30, right? Net 30 is the standard, right? Yeah, anyone yeah. that wants to pay you with a 1099, that's a red flag, right? Mm. You might be able to do the job and it might work, but it's illegal in the state of California, right? Yeah. Really? And, mm, I, yeah, because there's a law called AB5. And basically as a film worker, you're not an independent contractor and there's different definitions of it. And I'm not a lawyer, so I might be saying this completely wrong, like nobody hanging their hat on my words. Basically, you don't get to choose your hours and your project and your stuff like that because you don't have control over your situation is how they've legally termed it, that you're not a contractor. Hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And it's and the reasons for it are obvious. Like the majority of this population in this in Los Angeles probably there's a huge industry here. Maybe not yeah. the majority of the population, yeah. but it's a massive industry. You're not paying taxes correctly. With the pandemic, you can see people can't file for unemployment. The healthcare thing, you have to pay your own health care, all of this, versus the health care fund that you pay into when you're getting paid through payroll. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So that's but whenever somebody's paying 1099, unless it's like a short film or something like that, yeah. I'm I'm in, I incorporated with a little extra protection, but just that's like that's the first no, red no. flag. Yeah. It's not a no no. I mean, a lot of our main clients do it. It's very frustrating, and it's like every time you hope, you hope something will change, and it's really hard not to hope somebody gets like made aware <laughs> of their stuff. You know, yeah. it's really hard to not harbor that. But you want the crocodile to grab someone's leg so that. <sighs> yeah, we didn't get a crocodile. Luckily, I gave him the number <laughs> of the place to rent it, and it kept him busy for like two hours. He was on the phone, and he's not a, you know, crocodile it's, was it's busy. Not that, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he has redeeming factors. He was under a lot of stress. Blah blah blah. I don't want to talk yeah. ill of anyone, but. It was a really good tool to be like, yeah, figure out what it would take to do a crocodile. He's like, found out, he's like, we'd have to build these pins and stuff. And I'm like, just focus on the crocodile <laughs> so that it. we can, because there was always these changes, like raising the entire, their, their cantilevered shipping container. So there's three of them. Raising them a foot off the ground is massive. That's so much weight. You yeah, know, I can't no, remember it can't. now, but you, yeah. we, we did it. Oh, God. And so funny, just we because it. it's a big guy yeah. that was like the host of it, right? No, no, it was the mayor of the city was going to be a guest. Well, because he's a he was a wrestler. He's yeah, a, I guess. I I mean, I don't really know. I mean, a lot of this stuff I don't really, understand the context. This is like a but, Parks and Rec uh, you know. plot line. Yeah. <laughs> At one point, one of our carpenters came up to me and he said, "The stuff he's asking, he's not asking you to make these changes. He's trying to make it your fault that they fail." And the last oh. one with the pit, it became our fault that they failed, even though. I said no multiple times. I said no firmly. He's the one that changed it. The owner of the company to them, it's us, right? It's art department. And it's like all of these changes and stuff. If you said no, he would just go behind you. There's nothing you can, I mean, you just need to walk. You need to walk. Yeah. You need to say no, you need to leave. I really messed up on that one and I shouldn't have kept on that job. We finished it. They filmed something. And I think probably somewhere in Florida, there's a stack of six shipping containers eating up rent or something <laughs> who knows mm. who knows if they got him out or if they got him out i hope the local people got paid because they were awesome yeah explain the process it's something that i've never gotten to go through I, I almost did in one show that i did but like actually walking from a show what are the feelings you have what are the anxieties of that process and uh, you mean leaving a show yeah leaving a show well you let somebody that you like down yeah there's always somebody on there that you feel really bad for and even if you're mad at them, it's just like, it's awful because there's a part of you that still thinks, oh, I can save this. I can fix this. Mm-hmm. Even when it's beyond repair, even when somebody's doing something, it's just, you have to, if somebody asks you to do something unsafe, you have to do it. If there's firearms are a good one. I got offered a job that would have got me in the union in 2018. And the director wanted to use a real firearm on his actress who might, who was his girlfriend. 
Really? And I said, absolutely not. No. And he was trying to, it, uh, the whole conversation happened in a very interesting way and I'm going to keep it limited because, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, you know, the people he ultimately hired didn't do that. And I think he hired probably the right people that he respected a little more. You know, if you can sense that somebody doesn't respect you and they're hiring you because they know that they can get you to do things the way they want, you'll hear that sometimes. You'll hear like, we worked with a director that said like, oh, I chose this DP because he just listens to me. He may not be the best, but he does exactly what he wants and he doesn't talk back. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're in that dynamic, if you're somebody that when you sense that you're the person that they're like, this person's younger, they're not going to argue with me. They're going to do things my way. And if they're asking for bad stuff, not if they're leading with a good heart, not if they're trying to teach you, not if they're just trying to get it done and they don't have resources, but if it's truly because they want it done a certain way. That's always kind of a red flag. Sometimes you can get around that, but it's just a sign that this person doesn't trust you and you have to proceed with caution. Yeah. Yeah. I originally wanted to do, I wanted to do producing and I got a chance to produce a feature in Berlin and Spain in 2017, I think. Mm -hmm. And we made it through. I think the biggest lesson that anyone that feels like they haven't made it for whatever reason, whatever that means in your mind, don't go out and take something that you don't feel like you can succeed at. Be aware of what your emotional maturity level is because it's always less than you wish it was, you know? Mm. And like your job, if you're a department head, is to take care of other people. And if you're working for somebody, your job is not to let that person down or if you do it to communicate honestly when you're failing, Mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I was going to ask this earlier, but why why haven't you gone into union? I feel like you would have had the opportunity that's how much you've worked. Um, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I think like the last year of builds have been pretty good, Mm -hmm. but my communication isn't up to where it needs to be yet. There will be a time when the, when the opportunity crosses my path, if I just keep going. Mm -hmm. And for now I get to work with a lot of really interesting, talented people that are, you know, outside of the union circle. Some of them are union Mm -hmm. workers, but on some of the stuff we get to hire truly just artists. Like we work with this incredible scenic right now and she's not union. (laughs) I mean, there's fun in those things. There's fun in figuring this stuff out. At some point, maybe even this year, I'll actually apply. Mm -hmm. But I want to make sure that I don't, that I have the skills necessary when going into that world. You know, there's places where if you make, the mistakes you make on different levels spread in different ways. So I want to make sure that I learn under these situations, which are probably harder than some of the other situations we'll be facing later. Yeah. You know, you're with me on this. Yeah. You're with me on these sets. Some of them are nightmares. A lot of them are nightmares. Yeah. Yeah. And my like, you know, I'm not good at asking for enough money. I come from a place where like money means something entirely different, you know, mm-hmm. just the middle of America versus the coasts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like yeah. it's just unfathomable, like what's available here. It's really wild. And you don't think to ask for enough of it. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I was shocked when I first moved down here. I was like, oh, my friend is going to make a short for $5,000. I was like, holy shit. Like in Oregon, I the, with Hayden, the stuff that we made, we made on like, made a web series on four hundred dollars yeah <laughs> like wow. that, uh-huh. that, that, just the, the amount of money available sometimes i'm like that or I, and it feels wasteful too like this the first mm-hmm. um little short i did with a friend here with it we ended up renting a, a studio for a bedroom set it's like a studio that it was nine hundred dollars a day and we should shot that one day but i was like i i have a bedroom <laughs> like why, <laughs> exactly, why, yeah. why aren't we using one of ours <laughs> mm-hmm. And like, it was like a four, we've spent like four hours in there. It's like that, that, I wouldn't even think to look for a studio if, if it's something that I can get in another way. But so I kind of, I kind of get that divide. Yeah. It's really interesting. And it is really upsetting how much waste we make. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really upsetting how much waste we make and how much time it takes to like properly recycle stuff. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, it's, there's a lot of like, more of us need to be paying eco sets to take our good pieces. Yeah. yeah. You have to pay to drop off and you mm-hmm. should pay to drop off because that's a whole takes a lot in this city. There's no room. There's no room to house your stuff or chase a yeah. recycled sets, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. a, that's a weird like gap that I've, I've noticed there. So on these art sets, we, we build the walls, these giant eight by eight or 10 by 10 walls. And there's sometimes up to 10 of them just for a commercial, like a mm-hmm. really simple commercial. And then afterwards, the problem is always every time, what do we do with the wall sets, uh, with the wall flats? And this is a problem that, you know, happens. Maybe there's like a thousand wall flats a day that are that people are asking, where are these wall flats going? And there's like two recycle places where you, where you have to like, uh, I was asking a, a, a guy, how do I, you know, get the process started? And he's like, yeah, you have to like 
constantly be in communication with them. And this guy would go, he would regularly book appointments with the recycling place mm -hmm. um, just so that, that he would be one of their, their close people. And under the guise of like, I'm going to go to your uh, recycle place, which is just essentially just a whole bunch of wall flats of different kinds that are recycled. And you can go there and look at them and then buy one if you like it. He would make appointments for that because the appointments, if you miss an appointment, you get kicked to the back of the line and there's like month waiting waiting periods to even go see the wall flats yeah he would book every month he would book an appointment just so he was in with them yeah not having a project to look for wall flats wow. for. he would just go in mess around for a bit dip out again just so that when it was time for him to recycle and actually maybe even look for wall flats he was in the roster and it's like mm -hmm. why, what and then such a process yeah and then the other wall flats when that's not an option we've taken them apart and just like we donated them. well we or donated, donated them. them we donated some to compost la yeah but it's, emily made some art out of some but of it's them. always yeah i mean we always try to use them for something but I it's a problem you know like and i i heard from yannick something that you like doing is uh uh outsourcing with the uh, thrift stores and trying to find props and things uh thrift the hunt. oh i love the estate sales <laughs> yeah i'm yeah. a big estate seller yeah but that's like again it depends on what you're doing. If you're doing a narrative thing, you can have a couch with character. Mm -hmm. You can find it and it can be like, you know, this person could have bought any number of couches at their time of life and it's less dialed in than if it's, you know, a commercial, you have to get client to approve it. And even totally. if it is like a couch with character, it's hard to do those because you need to get them, get them approved and get them on the truck and no one's holding anything for you. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's a, it's, it's tougher not, with, for, with, when it's a commercial, yeah. Well, it's just different. I mean, there's stuff that's easier and stuff that's right. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, the the but I miss narrative. Yeah, I really. Do. Yeah, when yeah. I did that one, um, I did I DP a PD the commercial and that one narrative that you gave me the with that with that one woman in Colorado. But that one was so much fun because we uh, it was like a um, a girls' summer camp and to to dress the cabins, we just went into her garage bagged everything up she had in her parents garage and just unloaded it into the cabin and made it all work and you know in a commercial they, that would not really be no yeah a thing and, and well it kind of sometimes it is and some it's just about the right crew and stuff like that yeah, each time it's guess, just a yeah. different structure yeah. but that that's such a fun part of art department i think and I, th I know you agree it's just getting to dig through like treasures oh, yeah. and stuff mm -hmm. yeah i love i love just seeing like how things used to be made and like yeah, there's like this one. I was so per excited. I found this like brass. Um, I guess it was an ashtray holder Your shaped wallet. like a fly. Oh, oh no, no, no! It's an ashtray oh, okay. holder shaped like a fly. And I was like, this is so cool and unique. And then you find like, over the course of looking at stuff, you'll find like ten more, and you'll be like, this one specific item was mass produced in like <laughs> yeah. the 30s or something. Not the 30s, but you know, you're like, this yeah. is this is good, great. Yeah. It's like interesting to see just what we have now that's about to go away forever. And, you know, it's just like, it's just in for a bit and then it's out. What, okay, what are the, the, I wanted to ask you this, what are the weirdest things you've ever found for a job and been able to use? What do you mean? Like weird, weirdest Pro objects, objects, something like props objects. or like tables or like something weird. I don't think we've done anything too, I mean like. It might not be weird to you anymore. I think that might be the. <laughs> yeah, because, <I> <laughs> I mean, anything like you look at, you can you can find a fun use for. Oh man, I'm really striking out. Sorry, I've been feeling Wait. so comfortable here that I'm not thinking. <laughs> like the adrenaline's not kicking in. Um, How dare you be comfortable? I know. We recently did one where the um, it was about Bitcoin, and the you had designed this thing. Many f really fun things. One of them was aquariums um, in TVs. That was really fun. Oh yeah! Like uh, that we had taken out the screen and then manually glued in like an aquarium, and that was really fun. But the glue, we didn't have enough time, and the glue <laughs> they were leaking. <laughs> we the didn't TVs. use aquarium glue. We used <laughs> Home Depot epoxy. Oh no! And so we every shot we had <laughs> we had to run in, mop everything up, refill the water. Oh, yeah. And there was a real fish in one of them, which is it's still we'll, alive. We'll cut still out. alive. <laughs> yeah. Still alive. Yeah. Still alive. Yeah. Still alive. But but and then. And, um, you made a the terrarium. Water's just slowly going. Yeah, down. terrarium. Terrarium, <laughs> the fake fish, lizard. Like, oh. <laughs> um, but then also for the other part of it was uh, the evolution of communication tools. I guess you could call it. Oh, which, that was fun. Yeah, and that that kind of reminded me of uh, on the topic of weird objects because we literally had like the first block phone all the way up to like a modern laptop, mm -hmm. and then we kind of put them all in in order on uh, suspended in, in space, kind of if you can imagine it. Um, but that was all going through thrift stores and finding like weird old technology that, you know, doesn't have any value anymore, but it's like super unique and out there and 
Yeah, that was really that, that was, was really fun. fun. No, yeah. that was fun. I like anytime I get to like reupholster a chair or something like that. That's that's a blast. Anytime you actually get to make stuff, a lot of it's you know making life look normal, making normal life again and again for these commercials. Yeah, mm-hmm. I hope to da- someday to do something that's like a mix between like Brazil and pitch black. You know where you get to have like the di- giant like. Anyways, there's a bunch of stuff <laughs> I'd like to do. Did you ever see Dream Corp LLC? Uh, no. It's on Hulu and it's some of my favorite production design. Not necessarily because it's like, you know, not everything's not like hand sculpted and molded. It's just like some bad prosthetic of like a USB port into a guy's finger. It's pretty great. Okay. It's pretty cool. brilliant. The production designers want, like they, they need to, you know, they need the characters to go from like top deck down to lower deck as you would in like a sci-fi movie where you're being hunted by an alien and they just have them climb down into a la- into a barrel at the end of a ladder. Just really creative uh, yeah, use like, of like random objects. That's yeah. a lot more satisfying than doing something high end or getting to mess around with. Yeah. We, we did some fun stuff. Um, we were doing a job where a retired um, sports announcer and football player had to drive a sports desk around a Fred Myers in Oregon. So we got to take one of those like... Joe Holiday and I, I came up with the design and Joe Holiday did it along with his team. I think this was a sports desk, like with the lights and everything. And he drove it around a grocery store Oh, that's and fun. we put it on one of those, like, um, kind of like a hover around. I so I've seen that. So he was on wheels. The desk was on wheels and he was just, that's funny. Going through. he was just in there. Yeah. It was like, a that's good. Pepsi toast, um, Pepsi Frito-Lay commercial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, awesome. it was fun. I don't know. It's been so many. It was like we did like what fifty five in twenty nineteen, just fifty five wow. sets in twenty nineteen. So wow. kind of all blurred together. Yeah. This last one we had like moving walls and stuff, and you're in communication with the DP in the camera department, and then they get to set, and they they have this whole hallway that moves away, and they flip the shot list so that they're now shooting out of a fake window directly that you were never supposed to see in the original oh, boards. No. Like that sort of stuff <laughs> is always happening. Yeah. You know, you spend hours making something to impress somebody and then they shoot in the other direction so you really got to kill your drones <laughs> yeah. we have a t- yeah. two-parter we like to ask mm-hmm. um one of them being uh where would you want to see yourself in five years and i'll have yannick ask the other one but yeah where where would you want to see five ten years down the road where where would you want your career where would you want your life going oh i mean i think i have less goals than a lot of the people that come on here in that term i really like the work i'm doing i like the challenges i have yeah but for me right now, it's like having health care, getting a savings. No, and I'm really aware goals. that it might be when you're in your 40s as a production designer that that starts to happen. Yeah. It's a longer life pass than yeah. like a camera person that might be able to buy a house in their 30s or something like this, you know. Yeah. So I want to have kids. I want to have a family. It's not very interesting, but no, it's, it's a lot harder to like imagine still being able to do the thing you want to do, which is some form of. Some form of this. I like doing production. I like storytelling. I like visual storytelling. Yeah. And finding, navigating between how you can have children, have that lifestyle, and also do the things that you like doing. Not that you yeah. <laughs> not having yeah. children isn't what you don't like doing. <laughs> well, um, but I mean, like, yeah, it, if you want to do something like this and you want to keep doing it, because yeah. it's fun. Um, it's really fun. I mean, and especially when you get to do things where you get to design the wallpaper or, you know, the more the more choices you get to yeah collaborate with a team on but um yeah yeah and you know you have to plan like will you have the child alone or with someone else and all of this stuff and that's a lot to think about Mm -hmm. and and the the other question i i kind of primed you on the way over here for um it's better if you don't have a a, a planned out answer but message to you in 10 years we're going to send it to you record it take your time (laughs) <laughs> you just don't think about the past as much, right? So I don't know what the message would be, though. It's, it's whatever. We're going to send it to you in 10 years. So whatever you want to tell yourself. Well, 10 years from now, I guess you should say if it's exactly 10 years from today. It's exactly 10 years from today. You forgot Yannick's birthday last week. So <laughs> you should probably go take him to dinner. <laughs> yeah. Around okay. this time. Yeah. Around this it time. Yeah, be, yeah. It would be the time you, <laughs> you should You missed do it. Yannick's birthday again. <laughs> you need to take him to dinner. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, that's good. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank any, you. Any final thoughts for you want people to know you want um, you want the world to find out about you? About me? No. I mean, just if anyone ever has a question, they can reach out. I don't know that I'm in a position to really help people or give wisdom or anything. But you are. Even if you need it, like to know where to rent something, or if you ever are in a situation where somebody's asking you to do something and it's unsafe. 
the first thing you should know is if you feel that you don't need to ask anyone else, <laughs> it's unsafe. If you even feel it's a little unsafe, it's unsafe. But if you need someone to back you up, you can reach out to Yannick or me and we will <laughs> tell you it is unsafe. You don't have to do that. And, um, cause that's the number one thing is yeah. you're not most of the time in this, you're having fun in the process mm -hmm. and you're learning things and you get to make stuff with other people, but it's not necessarily, I mean, there's some stuff that we've done. That's cool. We did a vice thing. That was really fun. Anti QAnon is great. Mm -hmm. That was really cool. But, um, for the most part, what you're doing is it's not going to shake the world. Yeah. You have to find a way to just enjoy it respect the people around you and make sure that nobody gets hurt. Even if it is going to change the world, it's probably not worth a single person getting hurt. Right. Just slow down. Yeah. It'll still get made. You yeah. know, is any of that like useful at all? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> we got a message of safety. To, yeah. <laughs> no, you answer. I mean, it was just final, <laughs> final thoughts. 13 yeah. episodes till safety came up. So I think yeah. that's, that's not many people Wait, really? have ever talked about we'll, safety. We'll talk about safety. We talked about it, but you, you said your message that you're sending well, that's this off with is safety. So, that's good. I mean, you know, you're going to make mistakes on every single job. Yeah. And every single job, you're going to make a mistake and feel bad about it. You're going to communicate wrong. Yeah. You're going to have it's an apology. Important. And sometimes you won't be able to apologize. Don't You can't live in the past. You can't feel bad about it. But you have to just make sure that there's nothing worse than somebody permanently hurting themselves. And that was the yeah. first job I was on yeah. that happened. Right. Yeah. I've been lucky that it hasn't happened since. But, um, yeah. That was wood, everybody, yeah. for the, I found I that on the people street. listening. Uh, by the way. Well, I know you did. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you did. Um, yeah, just that. And I was really lucky because I injured myself in 2021 and I had to start hiring other people. So for you specifically, yeah. it's the, you know, do the hero one man show as long as you need to, to learn everything Yeah. so that you can give some level of instruction. Yeah. But hire people as soon as possible because nobody's going to pay you for your time, but they'll pay your assistant for their time. Yeah. That's the way it goes. Nobody wants to give one person. A lot of people will contract out a job and say, I'm going to do all of it myself. But in the process, they're just stressed. They're miserable. They're mean. And then safety. It doesn't come out as good. Yeah. Safety if they're tired. Stre stress, tired. Yeah. Yeah. Share it. Share what you've got with other people. Yeah. yeah. If you can, it comes out. Everything works better. And there's always more money. Yeah. They just don't know. They don't tell you. <laughs> well, it's their job. But I mean, like, you know, it's your rate is at a level so that the person beneath you can have their rate so the person beneath them can have their rate, yeah. stuff like this, so that the youngest person on set can still pay rent, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't undervalue your time. Don't short sell, you know, short sell yourself for the services you're doing. And if you're doing a set and you have a price for it, and I mean, like, there has to be an emotional price for what you're making as well. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for, for being on. This is this yeah. is great. You two are wonderful. <laughs> thank you for coming, Chloe. Oh, thank you, Yannick. Mm -hmm. I'm... You're my mentor. <laughs> I'm accept it. I'm Don't. not. <laughs> we got to find you better mentors. <laughs> Chloe Risen, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Uh, no, that's Terrible. good. That's great, right? I can cut another one. All these are supposed to be like 10 seconds. And us failing to do them. I yeah. think I want us to be failing every time, but we it's tough to fail a different way every time. Uh, well. We should <laughs> maybe try to get Jude down here and start like have him yeah. barking. Yeah, Jude, by the way, is our, our hairy roommate. Um, yeah, does not pay rent. Yeah, not a big talker. Not a big talker. Of a barker. Barker and howls. A howler. In, in sets of three. Sets of three. Just like a Buddhist. What? Buddhist. Uh, Buddhism. Um, Everything's uh, three, in three? Odd, odds are a lucky number. So when you know, oh. you know, like the whole... That's a lot of lucky numbers. You can't win a lottery. Well, with... no, I mean, I, th I think it's just a collective. So like when you do the whole poly thing, you know how Buddhists have like the, I forgot what you call it, but it spins and it, you, you pray as, uh, as a you wheel pull of this. fortune. It's a wheel. Um, and then it, it spins and it usually has some kind of like gods on it and you, you do it oh, as I a sign of prayer. Okay. You, you, yeah. you know it? Um, you have to do it in an odd amount of number. It, it oh, could be, okay. Okay. You could do it once. That's fine. You could do it three times. Okay. I'll keep on going. You could do it five times. Yeah. What, what about what about seven? Yeah, it's seven. Seven works. Okay, then eight. I thought, no. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay. <laughs> you can't do it eight times. <laughs> do we should limit this like everybody gets two soundboards <laughs> an episode. <laughs> no more. We should give the guest at least one the opportunity. Guest, yeah, one. <laughs> <laughs> but I like just having this. I think just that having the the funny. Very funny. Comedic. Um, Hilarious. I think we're in the outro right now of Chloe. Oh, we're doing Chloe. Oh, did we already do the Chloe outro? No, I guess we didn't. We huh? did not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great person. Great person yeah. to talk to. And I need to put myself back into the Chloe time. Um, what did we talk about? You're always telling me I'm a mouth breather, and I, here you are, I, mouth breathing. I've heard a complaint that I don't snore, um, but I do breathe heavily. A complaint and I think, that you don't snore? Yeah. Because I, I asked for the, the people that I sleep around if I snore, because I feel like I snore. Like, it, just listen to my voice and say I don't snore. This this is a, <laughs> a nasal infection waiting to happen. <laughs> and so I know for a fact that I snore because, like, my nose, like, see, this well, is me talking not. with my nose you plugged. Think people are lying to and you? there's not much of a difference. <laughs> I don't use my <laughs> nose. <laughs> for reference, he's he's covering his, not not now. He's not covering his nose. I'm covering now, my nose now. Covering his nose. No, I'm he not. Might, Okay, yeah, that's really seen, not a lot of not difference. much of a difference. Don't okay, but use apparently you're not so snoring. So where's the breath going? You're apparently not snoring though. It's out, <laughs> out the other end, maybe. I, <laughs> oh, <that's, laughs> but uh, the the critique that I get from actually most people is that I breathe heavily, and I want to ask what's the difference between snoring and breathing heavily? Yeah. Well, one of them you do. Oh, you mean when you sleep? Okay, I thought you meant you. No, like, what's the uh, difference when you, when you for the user? I, I, I would say breathing heavily is just as as like annoying. when you sleep, though, not just when you exist. You breathe heavily. <laughs> <laughs> no, just trying to live, man. <laughs> just trying, no, when <laughs> Sorry. I sleep. When I sleep. What's the difference? What's the okay, difference? I'll give you an example. <sighs> That's a little bit of a snore. See, I'm I had snoring. A little, <sighs> like when it's like vibrating, it. and then a he- heavy breathing is. Um. Oh, I got some ASMR here, and then snoring back, snoring. See, I can handle that. I can handle that snore. I've I've lived with yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's the stuff. It's when it's yeah, when, when it's some... like it's like it's a, when the rhythm happens. That, yeah, that's what bothers that's fine. me. A basketball oh. hitting the ground bothers me. Oh, you don't want the rhythm. You want it I don't to be want chopped rhythm. up. I, I want. The I need. I need it consistent. If you snore consistently, I'm okay. But if you're doing no, that's what I mean. Like if it, yeah, that, okay. So we are on the same page. You need it to be. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it time, and I don't want to bring this person up, but you know who you are, and you're probably listening. That they, uh, your mom. Um, <laughs> no, but they. Like there's moments where it's like the the like we 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 hear them snore and we're like, is he okay? Yeah, because you're like, is is something stuck because in you, there? You get yeah, well you get the, <laughs> <laughs> and then you get the, and then it, it stops. It's got to stops it's for just, about five ten just seconds. Quick, <sighs> and like, oh, and the, the whole family is just like kind of we we tense up, and we're and we kind of look. Oh. And then wait, the release, wait, whole, and then we all kind of wait, breathe what's the out. setting? Everybody's sleeping in one room. Your whole family is. This person likes to sleep on the couch. So oh, it, it's, it your tends father. To... <laughs> no. Okay, what that father leaves... sleeps on the couch? <laughs> <laughs> that it doesn't narrow a lot of things down. Yeah, we're keeping it vague. <laughs> we're keeping it really vague. <laughs> Anyways, this is Indie Not Films. I'm Hayden Garrett. And I'm Yannick. And, uh, and thanks for listening. This is actually the intro, um, and uh, welcome to the podcast. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast, the one and only the podcast. podcast. Haven't made it yet, which we've yet to make, so let's get making. We actually just made it, um, and we're in this one we're interviewing Chloe. Chloe. Who's a... Pro- don't. <laughs> Why? She's a production designer. Come on. She, yeah. That is... A, that she does commercials. And she does some music videos sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes. Okay, I think we got it.
That's about 17 minutes of stuff, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did we get an outro for Chloe? No. Oh, that was the outro. That was I the made outro. it about the intro. Okay. Oh, yeah, because we don't need to actually we don't really need to it's just like random talk shit about it. Wrapped it up. And I, I would wish it's just more often random shit because when you reflect, it's like, let me talk about the thing we just talked about. Yeah, for an yeah, hour. it's a little boring usually. You're right. We should just have fun top and bottom. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> For some reason, yeah. that was very sexual in Hayden's mind. Let's have fun, top and bottom. Yeah, I mean, I want everybody to have fun, but I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> for some, for, for that some reason, have... that was sexual. Yeah. Do I have to explain why? That... Yeah, explain. Let's have fun, top and bottom. Top and bottom. Let's it could, just it could have a be, good time. It could be uh, left and right, <laughs> or uh, on some person doing upside down handstand, the other person towering above. Well, this show is now going to be. This is Chloe, Chloe's is going to come out next week. And so let's oh, let's really? introduce. Oh, yeah. um, we are now switching from our bi-monthly schedule to a, a weekly release. A weekly release. Yeah. Uh, so that's going to be a thing coming your way Monday, eight a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Get ready for more indie nut. Haven't made it yet, people. Mm-hmm. Was that good? Did you? Yeah. D- d- <laughs> yeah <that's... laughs> As I would say. Excuse me. Uh, it staying in this vein. Staying was that good for you? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it was fast, <laughs> okay. but it was it was good. There was a s- slight enjoyment, though, right? Yeah, I mean, it it usually doesn't happen this way. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Just kind of spewed out. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> too much. Yep, you're right. Okay. Goodbye. Weekly podcast coming to you. Can't wait. See you, uh, see you next or week. Or wait. Uh, little week. Little week.